Hey everybody, I'm Ben from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors, world's largest organization of home inspectors. And um, this is a free webinar that we do um, just about every month on NACHI TV, N-A-C-H-I dot TV, N-A-C-H-I dot TV, I'll take you there. So it looks like that, N-A-C-H-I dot TV, it's got the old TV with the rabbit antenna ears. And um, you can register for a free webinar uh, we do things about anything you want to know about home inspections. Um, we go through the process of performing an inspection, performing inspections on certain systems. We have special guests. Um, there's questions and answers. Uh, if you register and then you have to go somewhere and you can't attend the live event, no big deal. I'll send you a recording of the webinar so you won't miss a thing. You, you can watch it later. So go to nachi.tv and register for a free webinar coming up. Even if you can't make it, just um, register anyways. And if you are live online, feel free to ask questions. So if you registered for the webinar, you click the link and something popped up on your, on your computer screen um, where you can chat. So I can't see you. You should be able to see me. I can't hear you. You should be able to hear me. And if you wanna say hello or ask a question, um, or talk to other uh, attendees of the webinar, um, feel free to just chat something. That would be great. We had several hundred students register for today's live webinar class. That's great. At the end, uh, if you stay for the whole event, you get a certificate of completion, and it's good for InterNACHI continuing education credits. Um, so let's go here. So. Today's presentation is how to perform a home inspection. And it is about how to perform a home inspection. We're gonna go through a home and a home that I inspected. So we're gonna inspect that house by going through all the pictures that I took during the inspection. And we're gonna talk about several other topics like um, marketing and business and things like that. And if you wanted to contact us, um, there's the contact page, natchi.org slash contact. And that's where we all are, which is a good idea, a good resource. If you're an InterNACHI member, you have at your disposal <laughs> to use about 40 full-time staff members. And for example, there are seven uh, very professional, highly talented, creative illustrators, designers, and consultants, and an editor-in-chief that work at the InterNACHI member marketing team. And that's uh, that uh, department is on um, the contact page. So if you wanted to contact the member marketing team, um, it's right there at natchiorg slash contact. So let's see. Looks like I have a frozen screen. Let me see if I can fix that. Technology is great when it all works. <laughs> Let's see if we can get this. Uh, I see. So just hang on for a second. Looks like uh, GoToWebinar has uh, crashed a little bit. Let's see if I can pop up again. Sorry for this, everybody. Let's see if we can get this to work again. About one out of 10 webinars have a serious problem. <laughs> okay, so it looks like my camera's back on. 
Hopefully you could see me and hear me. Again, I can't see you or hear you, but if you have a question, feel free to ask um, a question using your text. Um, we're also live on Facebook, um, and that may be causing the technical difficulties. But um, yeah, so if you wanted to contact the Internet Chief Member Marketing Team, we're on the contact page, and that's at natchez.org slash contact. Okay, let's inspect this home, but we can talk about a bunch of other things if you wanted to. We can talk about how to perform an inspection, obviously, software and writing reports, business strategies, scheduling and time management, hiring inspectors or employees, branding, marketing and websites, calculating profitable fees, handling complaints, standards of ethics, real estate agents, job leads, reducing your liability and legal issues, anything you want. So feel free to ask questions, Facebook Live and through the GoToWebinar system, okay? Shall we continue? Can you all hear me? You can type in hello. That'd be fantastic if you can all just type in something in your little text area. That'd be great. All right, James. Hey, Miss Laplante. How are you? Nicole, Eric, Angela. Fantastic. Okay, so let's do a home inspection on this house, okay? Everything we do at Internachi is accredited. So InterNACHI is a, an accredited post-secondary educational institution. And we do tuition-free online um, live and uh, e-learning uh, training, certification, examination, continuing education. And uh, we provide CEUs and credit that can actually be transferred to any university in the United States. Um, we're the only home inspection school that's accredited by the U.S. Department of Education. And uh, so when you um, enroll in a class, make sure it's accredited by um, someone. Um, so InterNACHI is accredited by the U.S. Department of Education. I believe we're the only institution um, for uh, only college accredited college for home inspectors that provides tuition free training and education. And that's at internachi.edu. And the .edu domain name um, is a good indicator of an accredited institution. If you don't have .edu, uh, it could be just a for-profit company. Um, uh, so that's all I'll say about that. Look for schools that are accredited. Performing a home inspection is fairly straightforward. All the knowledge that you need is online and free through InterNACHI. So if you need the knowledge of how to perform a home inspection, how to perform a roof inspection, you can go online and we have many online resources. And you take those training courses and you learn how to perform a home inspection or a roof inspection or a furnace inspection. We have videos as well. That's the easy part actually of being a successful home inspector of operating a successful home inspection business. What's difficult is building and operating a successful business because you have to do both. You have to be technically good and also good at marketing. If you're just thinking, well, if I can just be a, the greatest home inspector, I'll be successful, that's wrong. You have to tell people that you're the greatest home inspector and that takes marketing and a business strategy. If you are terrible technically, if you are incompetent at performing an inspection because you haven't taken any internet training, well, and you're great at marketing, well, that's terrible too, you know. So we don't want you uh, hurting the public <laughs> by being a terrible home inspector, but really great at marketing. What you want to do is you want to be good at both. Um, and so you want to go online and get free online training. Don't pay for any kind of training when you have access through InterNACHI School to free online accredited training. And the marketing and business resources, well, guess what? We have that as well. And I'll show you that later. And you want to attain this. And it doesn't matter if you're in a licensed state or not. In Colorado, where I'm from, it's unregulated. Home inspectors are not regulated. So what 
what should you do? Should you just become a home inspector in an unregulated area, state or province? Nope. You should attain some type of accreditation from an accredited institution like international. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. So whether you're in a licensed state or not, attain something that consumers demand. Consumers are looking for right now, or they're on Google and they're talking to their friends and real estate agents. So they're looking for an inspector who's professional and certified. So Internachi got CPI, Certified Professional Inspector, trademarked. It's a federal registered certification mark. No one on the planet can say, I'm a certified professional inspector. You can't use those three words unless you are actually certified by Internachi. It's a good idea to get accredited and certified, sorry. Before we start an inspection, I wanna share with you my daily routine. And you can develop your own routine. Try to look at mine and use it for inspiration. I did two home inspections every day. I left early, but I came home before five in order to have dinner with my family, right? So I leave at around seven o'clock and I arrive at my first job early. I had an eight o'clock and a 12 o'clock, eight and 12. And my home inspections mm, were about two to three hours long with a break in between. So about an hour um, in, the, in the morning, an hour in the middle of the day of driving and an hour at night to come home. So it's three hours of driving with two jobs at about three hours. So that's a long day. However, I made a lot of cash. I made stacks of money operating my own business. And I think that's your goal when you're a business owner. If you wanted to make a good living, you could get a good job. If you wanted to make a great living and set your own time and be your own boss and hire people and make a ton of cash and do good things in the world, not just pay your bills, but go on vacation and then do other things. Then, and, and take on all the risk and responsibilities that that entails in operating your own business. Well, that's, that's what we recommend here at Internachi. We have all the resources for you to be your own boss and run a successful home inspection business. And again, um, the knowledge that you need to be technically competent as a home inspector it's fairly straightforward and it's all free and online through an accredited school. But here's my daily routine where I made about a gross, maybe a little over a thousand dollars a day. And that's pretty good for every inspector in your company. If they can bring home a grand a day, that's good money. That's great money. So I start early, seven o'clock. I want to arrive at my first job early where I come from. If you arrive on time, you're late. So you arrive early and get your stuff, literally, um, your stuff, like your, your tool bag, right? Your appearance, get your business card out, get your tools ready, maybe even set up your ladder if you're gonna use a ladder, uh, ring the doorbell, introduce yourself, make sure the neighbors know about you, stick a sign in the yard, maybe some door hangers, Get yourself ready to do an inspection with your client because arriving late is just a terrible first impression and in this business you never actually meet your client until after they hire you and you meet for the first time during your inspection right so you want to arrive early so that you're not sweating and you're kind of calm and ready to go well, what i did was i arrived early and introduced myself to the seller if they were home occupied and then i got up on the roof I did a roof inspection. That's the hardest, most dangerous thing. You're not required to perform, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface, but you're, you're required to inspect the roof. So I did the hardest thing that, that didn't require me to meet my client you know, or meet anybody. I'm on myself, I'm on my own, so I, I go up on the roof. If I had extra time, I'll start the exterior. And by that time, by the time I get down from the roof inspection from my ladder, my client's there with me. So I, my client arrives around eight, right? And we inspect the exterior, in exterior together. And it's only about 15, 20 minutes to inspect the exterior. The, the heavy stuff is like 
the HVAC, the hot water source, the drain waste, the supply, um, the electrical, the structure, that's the big part of the home inspection. So doing the roof and the exterior, fairly easy, fairly quick. Um, you're looking for big defects, major defects. And you want to, you could, this is what I did. I inspected the exterior with my client. I asked my client, what would you like to do? Would you like to go inside and start measuring? That's okay by me. If I find a problem, I'll find you. You won't miss a thing. Or would you like to go around the exterior with me just for a few minutes? And I'll show you a few things. Even before I saw the exterior, I would just have my client with me. That helps me because I'm more efficient. I'm more efficient when my client is with me and I'm doing the exterior of the inspection and I explain the roof. I don't take my client up on the roof because I don't want to answer the phone at night. I want their questions answered immediately while we're performing an inspection. So not only am I learning how to communicate, not, not only am I, have I learned how to inspect a house, I've learned how to communicate too. I can inspect and talk and answer questions and take pictures and write the software, write the report using my software all at the same time. So it takes a little practice. So you can become a great inspector online, but eventually you're gonna have to inspect your home 10, 20 times, your neighbor's homes. Every neighbor should know that you're the home inspector. Every neighbor in my cul-de-sac on my street knows that I'm the inspector. They don't actually know what I do, but they know I have the infrared camera, the flashlights, the ladder, the moisture meter and things like that because I talk. Everybody knows that I'm the inspector. So uh, here's, my, here's my schedule. You have to figure out, are you gonna do one inspection a day or two inspections a day? Well, I got really efficient. So I was able to do two a day. And at about 11 o'clock, I'm finishing off my first inspection, my morning inspection, and I'm striking a card, right? And I'm getting paid immediately. And my report is actually written. And I send that out electronically. You can do a PDF or online report, but send it out. Because I am not writing my inspection report at night. So I'll show you how I do two inspections a day by doing one inspection with you. So I get there early and I inspect the roof. You're required to inspect the roof. You're not required to walk upon any roof surface. It's dangerous to get up on a roof. Stay on the ground if you can. Home inspection standards of practice. I use this as a guide, as the foundation upon which to build a very successful home inspection service, right? It's, it's successful because it guides me along, it's a guide. It tells me what to inspect and what's not required to inspect. And it helps me reduce my mistakes, reduce my liability, my exposure to liability. It's a checklist. And if you go there, it kind of looks like this. So here's the Internet G Home Inspection Standards of Practice. And here are the sections, roof, exterior, basement, heating, cooling, fireplace, and attic. And here's the roof, you click the roof, and it says, the inspector shall inspect from ground level or the eaves, yada, yada, yada. An inspector is not required to walk up on any roof surface, even if it's a flat roof that's a one-story building, a pizza shop or something, um, a condo or something, something like that. 10 feet up, flat roof, up. Nope, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface, according to the internet standards of practice. If you have a local standards of practice, you ought to refer to that. Okay, so that's at natchi.org SOP. Oh, and let me show you what I use. Let's see if I can get this to work. And I use this as a guide. So I have my Let's see, mm -hmm. if I can get this to work, I'll show you my software. So here's my inspection software on my phone. 
And so I go to my report. And here are the things that I'm required to inspect. And this is mobile software on my phone. Let's open it up a little bit. And it's a brand new um, report. So I haven't even taken a picture of the photo of the, of the, uh, of the house, but I could actually, if I wanted to. So I take a picture like that. Um, so if I go to roof, it's a couple of things that help me here. It helps me remember what I'm supposed to inspect. So according to the standards of practice, I'm required to inspect a few things. And then I put that into my checklist. It could be a document first, like a Word document, and you write it out, what you're going to inspect, and then you incorporate that, that checklist into your software. You could start with a blank template or the Internet GE Residential Standards of Practice template that most software companies use. If the software that you're using doesn't have the Internet GE Residential Standards of Practice template, don't use the, I would question not using the software or tell them contact uh, Internet GE. So you go to roof covering, and here are the things that I'm required to inspect, right? And there's some restrictions and limitations, and there are my defects. So if I find um, that I have exposed roof fasteners there, I just click the sentence. I don't type anything unless I, I have to. And there are the things that I'm required to inspect. So roof covering, flashing, plumbing vent pipes, gutters and downspouts, and if there's a chimney, well, I can, I, uh, skylight, I can add skylight. And if there's um, blue gas vent pipes from a, a furnace or something, I can add that as well. And if I go to um, roof covering materials, then I can select asphalt and I inspected it from the ground, maybe I inspected it from the ladder, and I can take a picture of the roof, and I can use that in my report. now. That's in my report as a, a picture. And so when I'm inspecting, I'm following a checklist. I'm taking pictures and video. You can take video as well. And it's basically, um, it makes me look really smart. I can't forget what to inspect because it's right there in front of me. So for flashing, I have wall intersections and eaves and gables, and I'm, there's some limitations, and there are my defect sentences. Click, click take a couple pictures, select the sentences that I want, and I'm done. So I'm inspecting with my software, and my software is what I'm required to inspect. It's in my software, which is based upon a document that I made, which was based upon the standards of practice. You can't mess up. This is how you can do two inspections a day and gross $1,000 a day. That's the point. So if you are writing reports at night, and you and I are in the same market and we're competing, I'm eventually going to beat you because you're going to wear out and people are going to get ticked off waiting for you to write a report. While there's someone else in the market, Big Ben Inspections, who immediately after the inspection sends my client a full complete report with pictures and video. No waiting. A summary and a full report and I'll show you that full report at the end of this um, near the end of the presentation we'll go over the actual inspection report that I produced how are you going to beat that so you have to figure out if you're not using mobile software and you're not writing a report at the same time then you have to figure out how you're going to beat that because that is not something that people pay for you have to if you're writing a report and you say something like, well, our reports are um, available within 24 hours, yeah, that's not good enough nowadays. It's almost 2020, right? You gotta get with the times. There's beautiful software that's very easy to use out there. And if you need a recommendation, just email me. And we have some deals with certain software providers. So this is how your daily schedule could um, be influenced, right? By doing mobile software reports, you can do two inspections a day, and you can have a, um, 
and a, a daily schedule like this, where it's not a 14 hour day and you're making a lot of money and you're doing two jobs a day and you're not working at night, right? So that's an example of how you can be technically competent at performing an inspection, but kind of miss out on the business strategy. And you're wondering why your phone's not ringing because there are other inspectors who are providing incredible value. In business, you have to figure out how to provide incredible value that's greater than the cost of getting that service. Okay, so according to the standards of practice, you're required to inspect these things. So I get up on the roof. Again, you're not required to get up on any, any roof surface, but I get up on the roof because that's part of my brand. I make sure that picture and that picture are in my inspection report, which are passed around. I make sure those are on my website as well. And part of my marketing, my, my flyers that are designed by the Energy member marketing team, all the design work is free. And if you wanted to get very good at technically what um, is required to inspect, right? Maybe based upon code. We're not code inspectors. We don't say code. We say things like standard or, or best practices. But if you wanted to know, what does the code book say about inspecting the roof? Well, that's an excellent question. And, I'll, and I refer you to the International Residential Code. International Residential Code. The most recent um, iteration is the 2018 IRC. And section R903 is about weather protection, but they talk about three things, roof deck, roof coverings, and roof assemblies. And you ought to consider using those terms as well. So roof deck is that which the roof coverings rest upon, right? So you have asphalt shingles and that's roof coverings and they rest and it's fastened to and is here to the roof deck. That's the structure that you walk on if you're going to walk upon any roof. The roof assembly is the system. So we don't really talk about roof systems, inspecting roof systems or roof assemblies. You really shouldn't because you can't see everything, all the components that make up a system of a roof assembly. So the roof assembly is the big thing. A component is something small like fasteners. So you can't inspect every fastener, can you, on a roof assembly or a roof system? No, it's a visual only inspection. It's highly limited. It's extremely restrictive. A home inspection is just a quick look at things, systems, big systems, and roof coverings, including roof coverings. You're, you're required to inspect the roof. Don't comment upon the system. The system includes things you can't see. So why are you commenting on? Like the underlayment and the flashing. That you can't see and the fastening that you can't see and the adherence that you can't see right so careful with your terminologies and this comes from the code so consider using roof deck roof coverings roof assemblies and let's take you to the code because it's a an excellent resource let's see if i can get you there okay so section R903 of the 2018 International Residential Code um, talks about roof decks shall be covered with approved roof coverings secured to the building or structure in accordance with the provisions of this chapter. Roof assemblies shall be designed and installed according to the code but the, that shall serve and protect the building or structure. So they talk about flashing. Where should flashing be installed? It's in all these locations. There's a section about locations. It's interesting because it says flashings shall be installed at wall and roof intersections where the wall or something intersects with the roof, right? Like a chimney, chimney wall tube, or um, a, a pipe penetration, or a side wall, a dormer, a skylight. Wherever there's a change in the roof slope or direction, so if you have a low slope to a, a higher slope, and it's not pitch, it's slope, slope and the changes direction there should be flashing there and around roof openings it says and that's anything that penetrates through the roof covering so that could be a vent pipe that could be um, a chimney stack could be a skylight things like that and flashing should be installed to divert water away from where the eave of a sloped roof yeah 
intersects with a vertical sidewall or an eave of a sloped roof. The eave, that's gutter, right? Gable is the other side. Gutter, eave, where the eave of a sloped roof intersects with the sidewall. Uh, that's at the end of the gutter, where the end of the gutter bumps up against the sidewall. That's a kick out. They didn't use kick out, but that's what they're referring to. We call it a kick out flashing, where that certain area kicks water away out from the sidewall and into the gutter. And if that's missing, well, that's a defect. And I call it a major defect because when it's missing, there's usually a hole and allows water to go behind the siding materials, the exterior coverings. Okay, so I thought that was cool to refer to the International Residential Code to get your terminology straight. So these are pictures that I took during an inspection. I take pictures of every plane, every surface, every component, and there's the roof covering. There's my finger touching the rubber roof membrane around the vent pipe that kind of penetrates through. Flashing is required, and if it's torn or damaged, that's a defect. It's not a minor defect. Homeowners don't have the skill set to replace something like this or fix it. It needs a professional, and so that's a major defect. And we'll go over some terminology about that, the differences between them. There's a roof vent, the gutters are filled. That gutter looks okay. I like that shot. It kind of proves that I was there up high where no other roof, uh, inspector goes. So that's part of my brand. I use any kind of ladder to get up there. So there's a, a collapsible ladder. I hate that they use, use that term collapsible ladder because it could collapse. but just to get up to the very top, I'll use anything I can do. Drones are great. Uh, sticks, painter sticks are great. Watch, don't get electrocuted. It shouldn't be metal. It should be um, non-conductive material. Um, binoculars, anything. You got to inspect a roof. And so I get up on a roof because, well, I built homes before I was a home inspector. I was a builder. And I learned how to do it safely. So I have experience, the skill set needed to get up on a roof safely. And I don't recommend you doing this. However, you have to figure out how to beat me in the market if I have that advantage over you. If there's a value proposition that your home inspector is going to get up on any roof surface, you have to figure out how to beat that in the marketplace. So what you wanna do as a business strategy is figure out how to overwhelm your client with incredible value that's greater than the cost. So if the, the value is greater than the cost, it's a good decision. And that's what your client needs to figure out. Is the value that my home inspector is proposing to give me greater than $500, then yeah, I'm gonna hire that inspector. Okay. So there's the sidewall, there has to be flashing there. It's hard to see the flashing in those areas because it's covered by the siding and the roof covering. But that is an attempt of me to see, confirm that there is some type of flashing there. I can't see everything, but I just want to confirm that there's some kind of step flashing installed. There's a gas furnace. There are some stack restriction, uh, stack um, minimums. That's in the code as well. Um, and it's in the InterNACHI's um, online courses about how to inspect furnaces and chimneys. Um, that's a gas vent pipe. And um, what I want it to be is at least two feet off the surface of the roof. And if there's anything within 10 feet, it's kind of like a masonry chimney. Anything within 10 feet, it's gotta be up two feet. So there's some, uh, some restrictions on there. And if you just remember like the code, the three, two, 10, that's pretty good. But for gas, it's two feet. So that's me checking it out. Little minor rust on the collar to prevent water from penetrating through that metal chimney. That's okay. I really don't like the way the flashing was installed. Um, Wind-driven rain can go sideways. It's very easy for water to go here. There's four inches, six inches of distance to get to the hole for water to penetrate through. These are not sealed. They really shouldn't be exposed. It wasn't installed very well. I would have done it in a different way where this shingle row comes all the way across, and this is all shingle covering. And you only have a little tab here, and you don't even have to fasten it. So there's some tricks 
to doing flashing well. And I don't think this um, installer did it well. So I'm going to pay attention to the underside and see if I can get underneath and look for water stains. If there are water stains, I'm gonna call it an active roof leak. This is a problem. This boot here, this flashing rubber um, is just destroyed. And any roof nail fastener that you can see ahead is a potential water entry point. And that's a defect. And it's a major defect because most homeowners can't even get up on the roof. So you need to hire somebody to get up on there. I don't like the staining rust. It's not very old. I'm gonna tap it with my screwdriver, but I don't want my screwdriver to go through anything that's rusty. This could be uh, prepped and painted um, to preserve the integrity of the metal capping. So that's what I'm gonna ask my client to do prior to closing, and then they can negotiate over it on what to do. You can't force any seller to do anything. So I, I'm working for my client and that's a concern that I have. There's step flashing at where the sidewall of the chimney meets the roof covering, roof surface. And that's about it for my roof inspection. Angela says, um, seems like a, an awesome schedule. It just seems unrealistic with the way clients schedule with me and their realtor schedule. Yep, you, you, sh you ought to, um, I would just directly ask if you're working with real estate agents, why don't you ask, what would be a good uh, schedule for your best home inspection experience? Let the real estate agent tell you that, yeah, I really like eight hour home inspections. I have, I've never heard of an agent who loves a really long inspection. They really like a thorough inspection, nothing too scary, because every house has problems and most homeowners don't even know about serious defects. Most homeowners are honest. They don't know that the roof is leaking, for example, and they don't want to stay there for more than two or three hours. Now, if you're in an area where you're doing like a four point or a roof inspection, I mean, it's a, you're down to the minutes, like 15 minutes, 30 minutes, boom, boom, boom. But if you're doing a full home inspection according to standards of practice, yeah, two, three hours is about right. Um, I don't think an agent wants to stay there much longer, any agent that I've met. But why don't you just ask? Why don't you ask the next real estate agent? You know, I'm trying to customize my service that fits your needs and your client's needs. And what would you say is a good time frame for a, a home inspection? Do you like morning ones? Do you like a nine o'clock, eight o'clock? Um, do you like it about two, three hours? Do you, do you want me to stay all day? I'll stay all day. So um, what, in my area, what worked was that schedule, two a day, in and out, in about three hours. Does walking the property with the client during the entire inspection slow the inspector down or distract? Daryl asks. Um, slows down just slightly, but it's worth it. So the amount of um, the amount of good things that happen when I slow down my inspection with my client is worth it. If, if I'm addressing, for example, questions and concerns from my clients while I'm inspecting, instead of addressing them later, that's a great way to be efficient with my time. Business strategy is to address your client while they're there. If they have a concern, I want to address it right now. If my client, I hate when my clients not, are not there because undoubtedly they will, inevitably they'll have a, a question, a, a series of questions about what happened at the inspection. What did it smell like? What did it look like? And they don't know because they were in California and I was in Pennsylvania or something like that. So I want my client with me. That's why video is great for absentee clients. You do a video, you do a body cam. I got a body cam somewhere around here and you record everything and play the video for your clients. You want to address your client's needs as efficiently as possible because that could be a drag on your process. What program are you using in your report? I like HomeGage, I like Home Inspector Pro, and there's EZ, there's Horizon, there's 3D. Um, I have on my phone Spectora, spectora.com. You go to nachi.org slash Spectora, and you can find some information there and a video about this software. Um, so I'm, I try to learn every software that I recommend, and right now I'm learning that software. 
Uh, John's having trouble hearing us. I, I apologize. Um, it's sometimes the um, the software itself that go to webinar system. So if you go back to your email and click the link and log back in, that usually works. Do you use infrared in your 396? Yeah, so I use infrared. Oh, 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 let's see if I can turn this on. That's not it. Let's see. Let's see if it's there. Nope, it's not there. There we go. Let's see if I can show you what I've got. If I can't, it's okay. I'll answer your question. There we are. So here's my infrared camera. And I use infrared because it helps me do a better job as an inspector. And so if that's one of the main purposes of helping me do a better visual inspection, then I'm not really going to invest a whole lot of money into a camera that's going to be kind of like a flashlight. So an infrared camera is like a flashlight. Don't freak out about infrared. This is a FLIR C2, uh, one of my favorites. The C3, I'm having problems with the, the Wi-Fi and the connection between that and my computer, but the C2 is really cool. Um, there are others, um, I think an E5 or E8 or something like that, or E6. The more money you spend, the more you see, basically. But I see it just fine with um, this infrared. And there are you know, things that you have to learn how this works. You don't want to interpret images incorrectly. So you want to make sure that you are using the infrared to help you see things that you wouldn't be uh, able to see otherwise. And it's, it's like a flashlight. The word flashlight. The word flashlight doesn't appear in the standards of practice. So one could argue that using a flashlight during a home inspection is exceeding the standards of practice. That'd be that one. So here's a flashlight. It's a really good flashlight. Um, and it allows me to see things I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. So a flashlight allows me to see um, under, uh, in that corner, under the table, right? Because without it, I can't see much. But with it, I can see things I wouldn't normally be able to see without using a flashlight. And every home inspector is okay with using a flashlight, right? Same thing with infrared. If I could have my infrared camera, um, an infrared camera allows me to see things I wouldn't normally be able to see without it, and there's the table there. And the cool thing about infrared is I can see things that are cool and warm. It's temperential, uh, temperature differences. So that is a cold area right there. I bet there's a lack of insulation underneath the wall outlet. You can just see the cold air dropping on the floor. Actually, I haven't looked at at this area. So there's the studs, there's the Minachi TV sign, and it doesn't, it's not x-ray. You don't see through walls. You see surface temperature with the infrared. And what I did was I use it on every inspection. If I'm gonna use a flashlight, why not use an infrared? Do I charge extra for it? I could, but I didn't. I just raised my fee because if I provide more value, then I can demand a higher price. Inspectors who just do the minimum, walk around with a flashlight and a screwdriver and no ladder, no um, home maintenance book, no um, crawl gear, no infrared camera, their prices are low. You can't really demand a higher price when you don't provide extra value. So I, I wanted to overwhelm my client again, overwhelm my client with incredible value so I can demand a higher price, so I can bring home $1,000 a day. And so I just used my infrared camera like a flashlight every inspection. And I included it for free. It wasn't free. I raised my fees. So my clients had the opportunity to pay for my inspection camera, basically. Within a year, I paid for my camera just by raising my fee just a little bit. No one even knew. Cosmetic, minor, major, material defects. 
Those are the types of defects that I identify. There's only one, one defect that's identified specifically in the standards of practice. And do you know what it is? Which one, which one of those defects is defined in the standards of practice? Which one of those defects are you required to report upon if you see it and deem it to be a material defect? Oh, I said it, material defect. So that's the only type of defect that is actually listed, identified um, specifically in the standards of practice. There are other things you're, you're required to report upon like um, active roof leaks or um, space that's too big in between the railing spindles, things like that. But a material defect is a serious one. Something's gonna, something's really bad with the house. There's an entire uh, floor filled with mold, or um, there's something that is um, like a deck collapse is imminent. Something that's gonna hurt somebody. A major defect is like um, a flashing problem that we saw on the roof around the vent pipe, and we need a professional roofer to go up on the roof because a homeowner can't do it. A, co a minor defect is like a, a dirty air filter and a homeowner should be able to do it because it's like a um, maintenance kind of thing now. You know, air filters can be changed out. Cosmetic is something that really doesn't show up in our report. It's not really part of a home inspection scope and it's, it's like a burn on the carpet from an iron or um, a stain on the carpet or a hole in the drywall from the doorknob hitting it or something, it's cosmetic. You can put it, I put it in my reports as courtesy only. Now these are defined in our glossary at natchee.org slash glossary. If you wanted to use these terms, remember we talked about roofing terms, roof coverings, roof deck and roof assemblies. So those, these terms are in our glossary, natchee.org slash glossary. And um, are you required to find every defect in a home? Are you required to find every defect in a home? You're a home inspector, right? I mean, isn't that the purpose of having a home inspection to, to report upon the, all the defects in the home? No. So a home inspector is not required to find all the problems in a home. Home inspector is required to report upon only those defects that she both observes and deems to be material. So if there's a defect above me, there's a, there's a terrible defect above me right now, and I don't see it, it won't be in the report. Your Honor, I'm required to port, report upon things that I see within the scope of my home inspection and that I deem to be material, so bad it's gonna hurt somebody or have an adverse impact on the value of the home. Another one of those things happened, so it's not in a report. I can't see a defect behind that wall there, that everything you need all in one place, that's internet, everything you need all in one place. There could be a huge wall behind that, the little banner there, right? Let's say I'm in the basement, somebody puts a cabinet on the foundation wall right there. That's happened to me. The seller moved the cabinet on a vertical crack in the port concrete foundation wall and it was leaking water, right? And I couldn't move that cabinet. It was huge, just like an old TV cabinet when the TVs were huge and big and heavy. Couldn't move it. The seller moves the cabinet as they leave the house. Homeowner comes in, there's a huge crack in the foundation. There's water streaming out of it. Yep. I didn't see it, couldn't see it, can't report upon it. Let's say I did see it. Let's say I saw a vertical hairline crack, no displacement, no separation, no water. I saw the crack, maybe I, I reported upon it, I took a picture of it, crack in the foundation wall, hairline crack or something like that. Later on it moves, right, and leaks water. Well, I'm not required to predict future events. If the foundation looked in good shape when I took a picture of it, well, I'm required to report upon the condition at the time of the inspection. If it leaks water through that crack a week later, I am not responsible for it. 
This is not a warranty or a guarantee. So if you get a call and say, hey, I just moved into the house and there's a crack in the foundation, you should go, wow, I don't think I saw a crack in the foundation. I'll take a look at my pictures and my report. I don't remember a major defect in the foundation. Could I come over and see what you're seeing? Yeah, come on over. And when you come down into the basement or somewhere in the house and there's this big defect from 20 feet away, you should go, holy cow, look at that. You know, that wasn't there during my inspection, right? It must've been covered up or something. And then you take out your pictures and you scroll through them because you take pictures of everything. Take pictures of the whole room. I'm trying to figure out how home inspectors can take a 360 picture and image. So you just click and you move on and click. Every room is just every inch of every room is taking a picture, is captured with a 360 camera. That, the 360 cameras are coming. So you want to kind of document what you see in your report. And you're not required to report upon all the defects, only the ones that you both observed and deemed to be material. Now that you know that, man, home inspections are a lot of fun. You're not required to find everything? No. Wow, I'm going to use a flashlight, maybe infrared to see more than I could see to make my inspections a little bit better. But I'm not required to port upon all the defects. There's so many defects in this room right now. I have no idea. Could be electrical problems in the wall, could be water, could be mice under the carpet or something. I have no idea. I'm only required to port upon the things that I both, the defects that I both see and deem to be material, serious stuff. Now you can have fun making a lot of money. We haven't even got to eight o'clock yet in my first inspection. Let's go. I'm done with the roof inspection, right? I walk around, I'm using my mobile software, I'm taking pictures and video, I'm writing the report. And before I step down from the roof, right? I'm done. I'm done inspecting the roof. I'm done taking pictures. I'm done capturing video. I'm done with everything. Wow. And now I go down and I meet my client for the first time after they hire me. Big smile on my face, shake hands, five business cards, because they're going to pass them out a little bit. And I never get one business card, five at least. So talk to the real estate agents and tell them about the roof. There's a couple of defects on the roof. What do we have? Um, the roof covering looks good. Gutters are filled. Rusted metal on the chimney cap. We have a flashing problem around a couple of the vent pipes. You think of anything else? No, nope, that's about it. Would you like to go inside and take measurements and do things out there? You won't miss a thing. I'm going to walk around the exterior and perform the exterior inspection, take 15 minutes or so. I would love it if you come along with me because we can address issues. About half of my clients just want to go inside. They want to get to their ideas of renovation and doing the kitchen and painting and carpeting and drapes and all that stuff. And when I come in from my exterior, I find them, tell them any defects that I found on the exterior, and then I go and do the other systems. So write your inspection report as you inspect. I inspect the exterior, exterior in about 15 minutes. And let's do it, okay? Let's see if we got questions here. Getting on the roof can damage the roof by disturbance or granite. Yeah, Angela, you can, especially on a hot roof, you can twist your toes, twist your foot. Let's see if I can get it on the camera. I'm not very good at this. So you can twist your foot like that and damage the granular surface of a hot asphalt shingle. So you don't want to do that. These boots are actually spongy soft. I'm not doing it roof inspections, but you can find shoes that look really good and protected, protect your feet and stuff like that, and are very soft for the roof. Um, some folks use special boots and shoes just for the roof. I used to use sneakers for the roof. And those are really nice. If it's too hot to walk on, you think you're going to damage it? Don't. Right? Um, so it's possible to damage roof covering materials, especially like tile. I don't walk on tile. I don't do slate. Um, metal roofs, I'm careful with metal roofs because I'm not sure what the roof decking is like. Sometimes, you know, I'll step on a metal roof and then be like, oh, so careful. Asphalt shingles is, is kind of fun, but that's for me because 
I'm experienced and I'm safe in doing the, the roof inspection and walking on a roof. Remember, you're not required to walk on a roof. Okay, um, have you used IR inspection as an auxiliary inspection? Um, I haven't. I just, I supported my core service, my home inspection service, by adding on certain things to make my core service, my home inspection service, the best thing in the market. Instead of having a good home inspection and a good ancillary infrared and good ancillary moisture meter, inspection and a good uh this kind of inspection and that kind of and like people love bundled so i bundled all of my other stuff that i used in my big tool bag right and i brought all this stuff i would even swipe well i still have it here i would swipe for mold right if they wanted to so i'm ready to go with other types of value propositions and i demanded higher prices because i overwhelmed my client with value and infrared is one of those easy decisions that a home inspection business owner can make. Buy an infrared camera, it, it's the shock and awe. It actually helps you perform a home inspection, but it's the fun stuff. Infrared is that fun thing, that value thing that you get that's kind of fun. It's, um, I'll, I'll tell you a short story about value and the word commodity. You should look up the word commodity. So uh, you go to um, a clothing store, so I would go to the men's jewelry area and you know the watches are there and there's a hundred watches and to the left are the cheap watches, inexpensive, they tell time, they're like 10 bucks. But over here, there are these watches that are like a hundred dollars. They do the same thing. They tell the time, right? <laughs> now, you, I don't know why people wear watches because we have phones. But you know they're the they do the same thing. So all home inspectors are actually doing the same thing. We're all doing the, a home inspection according to a standard practice. Basically, writing a report looks the same. So how can one watch demand ten times more than the other? How can one home inspector demand six hundred dollars while the other home inspector is doing it for two hundred bucks? Right? It's because of the perceived value. If the perceived value is much greater than the cost, then it's a good decision. And as a consumer, if I see value in those really expensive watches, I'm going to purchase one of those really expensive watches over here. And I really don't care what the price is because I see incredible overwhelming value, even though they're doing the same thing. They're telling time. So as a home inspector in your market area, you don't want to be a commodity. You want to be something special. You want to be um, demonstrating incredible value and demanding a higher fee. Because you know on the other side, if the perceived value, right, I perceive that value is much greater than the cost, then it's a good decision for me as a consumer. I'll buy that expensive watch all the time. I'll rent that really expensive rental car all the time because the perceived value of having, I don't know, heated seats or something is much greater than the rental cost. Um, maybe it's highly gas efficient, energy efficient car. That's the value, I'll pay more for that rental car. Um, it just goes on and on about commodities. So look up the word commodity. It means interchangeable without any difference. And you don't wanna play in that world as a home inspector, even though we are. We're all doing a home inspection according to the standards practice, all writing a report, we're all working at the same stuff, saying the same thing every day. What's gonna distinguish you from all the rest? That is your brand. Your brand is something you should work on as a business strategy. You have to work on what, your brand is the answer to the question, why should I hire you instead of the other person? The brand is, why should I buy this expensive watch when I can buy a cheap watch that does the same thing. Work on your brand. Who can help you work on your brand and your marketing and your business strategies? So we have, a, for example, a home inspection business course. Internet actually has a free online home inspection business course and it's open to everyone. 
you don't have to be a member to take it. You can just register. I think we ask your first name, last name, and email or something like that. And then you go in, go to chapter 11 of the InterNACHI free online home inspection business course. And that's a really cool chapter because we go through a real life example of how a home inspector calculates a profitable home inspection fee according to um, the amount of time it takes and their desire, his desired annual salary and the cost of running a business and all that stuff. It's a really great chapter of the free online home inspection business course. Okay, so this is what I do. I often get on a track and I don't know what I'm talking about. So, oh, we start the exterior. Okay, we're going through the exterior and here's pictures of the exterior siding, which is in contact with the ground, which is a bad thing. You want clearance. I like six to eight inches. Um, so uh, I like at least six inches, eight if it's a hard surface near the bottom of the siding material. That bottom of the siding material is actually covered up with several inches. I could see another row of the siding underneath the mulch. So that's a defect. I'm gonna put it in the report. It's a click of a picture and I click with my finger to say this a sentence. The picture is associated with the sentence of the defect that I observed. It's in my report, I'm moving on. I do not have to inspect and so, um, uh, detached buildings like barns and things like that um, and sheds, but I do as a courtesy because they're kind of fun to inspect, especially when they're in this condition. So the roof is shot, the structure is being uh, eaten by moisture, damaged by moisture, and eaten by bugs. Um, and there's a lot of problems inside the small shed, which is no big deal, but I put it in the report as courtesy because it's just fun for me to inspect. Oh, we have a question. Let's see if I can do a poll. So for those of you on the live webinar, we have a, um, a question about, um, let's see if I can share it on Facebook. I don't know if I can share it on Facebook, but I'm gonna try. And the question is, do you use mobile software during inspections? It's like one of the following answers. Yes, I use mobile software. No, I don't use mobile software, just a laptop or desktop software. And third one is I don't have any software yet. And so I'll give you like 10 seconds to answer the poll. I'll take a look at the Facebook questions. I don't think we have any. Jay says on Facebook, hello, everybody. Um, Angela said my audio was out and it came back on. Sometimes that happens. Bruce uses mobile software. Okay, in five, four, three, eight, two, one. Close the poll and I'll share results. And let's see what we've got. Okay, so 36% of you said, yes, I use mobile software, that's excellent. Um, 13 says, I use laptop software, that's good. And 51% um, 51 of, of you, half of you, of you, and we have hundreds of uh, registered attendees, um, you don't have any software yet. Ooh, so internet <laughs> I, we have a list of software providers that actually recognize InterNACHI membership and give exclusive discounts because you're an InterNACHI member. And um, so if you need that information, I can help you with that. Awesome, thanks for doing that. That was kind of fun. Let's do the exterior so we can get to the fun stuff like HVAC, okay? Okay, so Here's the fence, you're not required to inspect fences, but this one's leaning over. I do it as a courtesy. I'm back there anyways, you can see the shed in the back. Um, this fence is leaning over, it's in really poor shape. It's rotten all over the place. I've got one sentence that just destroys wooden fences. Um, it's really damaged as well. You can see the lateral ones are just, it's a mess. Gas meter, so I know that there's, um, I saw I already saw the gas vent pipe on the roof, right? It's a furnace, probably hot water too, I don't know but there's the gas meter shut off valve. I don't like the rust. I'm gonna recommend a couple things on that. There's a shut off valve. There's a rust on the pipe. It should be sealed as it goes into the siding. There's a hairline crack at the poured concrete foundation wall. It's okay on this side. Um, one of the things I like to do is um, imagine holding a quarter, right? And uh, sticking the quarter on edge into the crack if you can do that, or if there's a displacement of a quarter either way, I'm gonna call it out as a major problem. 
but this is hairline so far, but I'm gonna go in the basement and see if I can see anything. Or I'm trying to figure out, is this a basement or is this slab on grade? And maybe that's why the siding is so low because slab on grade houses tend to like be built right on the grade level and then they cover things up. So we'll see what's going on. Exterior water faucets, front porch. We could see that this is not plumb. Plumb means straight up and down. Um, and it's off to the side. So I don't have time to draw arrows and lines and text and all that stuff. So this is this is what I use for arrows, my hand. And so this means like the post is leaning. So I put that up. Driveway looks good. Snow covering, so I have a inspection limitation or restriction sentence. And I can't see everything because of snow covering. The exterior trim on the garage door is okay. And then I'm looking at why are these panels not lining up? These panels should be straight on top of each other. So the top panel of the garage door with the window panes, it's kind of like a half inch out. Um, so I'm not, it's not a defect from this side, but I have a feeling I know what's going on on the inside. So we'll take a look. You have to remember now, right? What did I want to remember on the other side of the roof? Remember there was, there's that chimney stack, the gas pipe, and the flashing wasn't installed well, and we had those exposed fasteners. Yeah, that's an example of like, here's one component or um, one observation of a system or component on the exterior. And when you get on the inside, you want to find that same thing and look at the other side of the quarter, other side of the coin, right? So you want to see the other side, what could be causing that defect, potential defect. So I'm going to try to remember um, to look on the inside of the garage door. There's an electric meter with cable and phone hookup. The meter is good. I try to pull it off the side of the house. Sometimes they fall off. So don't worry about damaging things. Um, it was, as soon as I damage something, I take a picture of it and put it in a report. I'm not supposed to be damaging anything. It's a visual only inspection. So, but if I like, um, if I grab an electric meter box and it falls off the house into my hand, I mean, that's a major defect that I discovered. That's fantastic. If I open up that garage door, that seems a little weird and it falls down in pieces. All right. That's my job. Well, yeah, it damaged while I was inspecting it with normal operating controls. I wasn't like, running into it or smashing it or holding on or hanging on to it, right? I was just using the, the door opener and it fell apart. I just grabbed the meter to make sure it was secure to the house and it fell off. Click, major defect, put in the report. Um, downspouts are diverting water away from the house. There's my ladder. This is an air conditioner unit, outside unit. It's covered with dense vegetation. I mean, that is textbook dense vegetation, inadequate clearance around an air conditioner unit. I mean, that thing is like trying to work as hard as it can and it's not breathing very well. I take a picture of the manufacturing labels of anything that I can get my hands on. I don't put it in the report, but if I need to refer to it, then I could if I wanted to. There's electric disconnect, should be inside of the air conditioning unit. There's the refrigerant line. The large line is the suction line. It's cool, it needs to be insulated. The smaller diameter line is the liquid line. It should be sealed where it goes into the house. There's a discharge pipe, plastic tube, and it is old and nasty. I guess there's a condensate pump near the air handler. So I'm gonna take a look at that. There's a chimney and the siding. Just taking pictures here and there. There's the gazebo wooden structure on the back patio area, the brick patio area. So I'm gonna take a look at that. All exterior receptacles need to be GFCI protected. There's the dryer vent, I think. So there must be a second floor dryer vent or something or some kind of exhaust hood. I'm not sure, but I can't get to it closely, but there it is. I'll try to find something on the inside. There's a small diameter PVC pipe, looks like a three quarter inch pipe or something, five eighths, maybe an inch. I'm not sure. I don't know what that's from. I'll try to remember. It's probably like a, hmm, a condensate drain line. Now, what would a condensate drain line be doing above a first floor window? Well, maybe there is like, maybe the unit is upstairs. Maybe it's in the attic and it's draining out. It's in the attic, it's usually like 
Okay, I'm not sure. So I'm going to pay attention to this. Okay, the wooden structure in the back. I don't like that the load bearing posts go below the surface. The bottom is actually buried in the ground. So I have a stick. You can do one of these. So this is a gardening tool. It's a three tine hoe. I heat up one of the tines and straighten it out so I can poke things and then keep the other ones curled so that I can grab things and put it back like insulation and a band rim joist. I can grab it. It's also extendable. It's a gardening tool. So it's extendable. Oh, like that. So this fits in my tool bag here. Can you see my tool bag? Yeah. And uh, I bring it to every inspection. And this is the same exact one that I've used 20 years ago. It hasn't changed a bit. And it comes in really handy. So I'll poke the bottom of the post to see if there's wood rot. Or I'll bend over, you know, and use my screwdriver. Or you know, if you have a hammer or something to tap, you know, you can do the, the sound um, thing, right? Uh, let's see. Should I report hairline cracks because they can cause moisture intrusion? In um, Angela, I report um, the hairline crack and I make a recommendation to monitor it if it doesn't meet those criteria that I, of a major defect that I mentioned before. Um, Richard notices that the crack is wider at the top. Yeah, so on a poured concrete foundation, hairline cracks are common because when the concrete dries, cures, uh, it tends to shrink. If it's a very long wall without a bend or, or a break, um, it'll crack by itself, and that's okay. What we don't want is signs of defects, and that would be a displacement and movement, opening, and water. So if it's hairline crack and it's a little bit more open at the top than it is at the bottom, that makes sense because the foundation wall bottom is essentially um, stuck. It's secured. And the top of the foundation wall of a poor concrete foundation is, well, I, would, I would call it loose and open. and allows, if it does crack, it'll crack at the top. It'll be more open at the top than it is at the bottom. And that's the, the typical shrinkage crack. And that could be epoxy so easily. Even if, if you wanted to make a recommendation, that's a good recommendation. Because it could, in the future, leak water. Who knows? It could break open more. It could, who knows what it might do in the future. You're not in the job of predicting future events. But you're uh, in charge of re reporting upon the defects that you both see and deem to be major. And if you wanted to, out of courtesy, recommend epoxy and a hairline crack in a foundation wall, I don't see any problems with that. It may not actually be negotiated over because there's no water coming in and it doesn't look really bad. But that's that's one of the things that I did all the time, especially when it came to like the big major things, major systems. I made a lot of recommendations to monitor and or repair. Um, and hairline crack, oh, we have a couple really good structural um, courses on how to inspect foundations, walls, piers, um, uh, structural design elements. And that's in our um, education uh, curriculum, accredited curriculum. Okay, good questions, good questions. So where am I? Oh, I really don't like how this thing was built. This is not how you build uh, a, a sound, safe structure that's over your head, made out of wood. Um, the bolts are rusting, wrong kind of fasteners. The You don't nail at the very end of a board. You don't attach a board to a post on the side. You let it sit. You cut out, right? So there's a shelf and your joist sits right there. Um, there's so many defects wrong with it. I really just didn't like it at all. And then I saw it was actually leaning when I, I should have caught it earlier when I was in the backyard. Remember I was doing the, the shed roof. I should have looked this way and said, oh, but you know, I go around once or twice. So that's the value of going around once or twice on the exterior. It's leaning over, it's leaning over. And it's actually settling. So the one post I was concerned about, when you look back, you can actually see that the middle post was actually settling down. 
And that's the post that I was concerned about because I can't see the bottom of the post. Ideally, the bottom of the post will be above grade on top of a really nice concrete foundation and a fastening system. And there's many different options. So um, this is a major defect. I'm really happy. I found, so far I've found major defects on the roof and now on, on the exterior. And I'm not even in the difficult stuff yet. I'm not even inside the house. And I'm smiling giddy because I charged what, five, $600 for this and they have gotten that back if they negotiate over these defects, they've gotten that back over uh, two, three, four, right? So their return on investment so far, I'm down two systems, roof and exterior, and my client has a huge return on investment. That's what you should be thinking about as well. That's a hazard for small children, ponds, open water, and um, the exterior paint is peeling, it's weathered. I'll try to look for wood rot like that that is major wood rot. You can just tell it's all squishy. So if you stick your screwdriver in there, which I often do, I take a picture of it. Um, you know, someone complained once that uh, I caused wood rot or something. No, my screwdriver just discovered wood rot and explained that this, the structure of the wood is no longer, the integrity is no longer sound. You can actually push a pencil, a screwdriver or any kind of object, your toothbrush through rotten wood. Right? I don't carry toothbrushes, I carry screwdrivers. That's why I put a picture of a screwdriver going through wood rot in my inspection report. It's kind of fun to explain. Wood rot. Exterior siding, uh, it could be washed, no big deal. That's really cosmetic. Got some algae on it. Exterior, exterior. So, you know, these pictures are me. Um, stepping away and taking a look at the exterior one last time before I go in, right? So you want to think of like three distances when you're inspecting anything on a house um, during an inspection. You want to think of far distance away, long distance. You want to cut that in half and come in nice and close or closer, closer cut in, cut that distance in half. So let's say 30 feet away and now you're at about a dozen feet away. You want to take a picture and now you want to move in real close a couple feet away maybe within touching distance you will see a lot of pictures have my hand i'm touching on things right so i want to get real close and then i take another picture so you want to have like three when you're doing an infrared scan of a room one of the recommendations is to think of like that so you walk into a room with your infrared camera and far away you want to take a scan and then you want to move in half distance and take a scan. And then if you see something, you want to move in to where you can almost touch that anomaly that you see in your infrared camera. That's how I inspect every system, actually. <laughs> uh, Gas-fired furnace, right? Go into the basement or the furnace room, take a picture of the entire system and see what's going on. And then you move in closer and you can see, oh, okay, this is where the air filter is. That's a condensate pump and that's the, Okay, and then you touch every component. And what do I what do I inspect in a furnace? I don't have to remember. Checklist is on my mobile software. It helps you be more efficient and make less mistakes. Uh, Michael says, I haven't mentioned the vegetation growing on the siding. I probably won't mention all the defects. This is um, you know, my report is actually really thorough and you know, this is a class and I'm trying to go a little bit faster because it could take a long time if we went over everything that I actually inspected. So there are probably defects here that I haven't mentioned. Um, and I know that, that I'm not going to mention everything. Um, Angela wants a, a webinar on new construction. You got it. We can do that. Um, will you, Daryl, will you include all of your pictures in the report? Only one showing defects. So I provide all of my pictures um, to my clients thermal images, all of my pictures and all my videos. I try to put all of them in the report, but you can't really. So it all depends on your software. There's a lot of uh, cover yourself, cover your backside with uh, all the pictures in a file, and then you select the ones you want in your report. I'll show you my report at the end of this presentation here to give you a, an idea that I took, I think 350 pictures total, but only about 40 showed up in the inspection report. 
And um, I provided all of my pictures to my clients and all my photos to my clients. We used to do it on CD, then USB, and now just electronic. Um, so uh, they can look at them from the cloud. And I never had any problems with that. It always helped that I was transparent and I showed everything to my client, showed my cards. And um, I think one of the concerns that home inspectors have brought up is that what if I take a picture of a major defect and I don't put it in the report and I give my picture of the major defect to my client and my client goes, hey, there's a hole in the roof. You have a picture of it, but it's not in the report. Okay, so you don't have a problem with like, uh, should you, you don't have a problem with the question, should you give all of your pictures to your client or not? You have a problem with performing an inspection, right? Because if you saw a hole in the roof, took a picture of it and forgot to put it in the report, yeah, you're, you're responsible for that. And you can't hide behind that. So it, don't worry. If you see a large hole in the roof and you take a picture of it and a video of it, you should be putting it in your report automatically. Because if you take a picture, you should be using this. If you take a picture of a defect, it, it will appear in your software right where you want it with the sentence that this is a defect, okay? So that's another way to eliminate mistakes. Way back when, when I was doing inspections with paper and pen, we actually did paper and pen, yeah, there could be a lot of error there. Taking a picture and forgetting to put it as an attachment with the document that you printed out. Uh, nowadays, you know, it's 2020 almost, it's time to use software that helps reduce your liability and helps reduce making mistakes. It makes you more efficient and actually adds perceived value to your service because you've got your software rocking and rolling. Um, Scott, are you using your phone to take pictures or using digital camera? So I used to take, I used to carry a pouch with two digital cameras and then um, connect them to my computer and download the pictures. Now, uh, you know, when I started doing inspections, I did inspections in Pennsylvania for 12 years. We didn't have these. We didn't have iPhones. We didn't have mobile phones. We had these PDA things that I did inspections with. So I, I did this and then I downloaded the pictures with the cameras. Now it's all incorporated. So use your phone. It has fantastic image capturing and video capturing and audio capturing features. And Again, you take a picture while you're at the system and you select the sentence that you want in the report in that picture and your defect sentence, your narrative that we call, the, the group of sentences that describes the picture that you simply select. You don't type in anything. I don't even type, I can't do my thumbs like my daughters do. So you can do voice command on, on most software. You know, if you have to write a sentence, just use the voice command. And it pops right into report right where you want it. So, yeah, it's a it's a great way. I highly recommend all home inspectors using mobile devices. Done with the exterior. Now I want to inspect for the next hour or so the big stuff: HVAC, hot water source, water supply, drain waste vent, plumbing, and then I'll get to electrical and structure. HVAC. There's a thermostat. I take a picture of the thermostat. That's an old thermostat. Should be programmable. It's not. There's the HVAC system. It's a gas-fired furnace. Remember the gas meter on the outside with the rust? Gas shutoff valve for every appliance. Air filter, I show my client where the air filter is, the size, the direction, every 30 days, yada, yada. There's how you access the air filter. The bottom panel comes out. There's the burners. This is a natural draft furnace, so the burners are open. They're burning combustion air that comes from the air uh, of the house. Um, there's a couple things you can pay attention to. Just take our HVAC course. I take pictures of every system and components. Um, there's a lot of wiring on these old systems and the new ones, but um, there's a lot of sensors as well. This is the part of the heat exchanger. I like to take a picture of that because sometimes there's some funky stuff there. I don't see anything wrong. There's no service switch, so it's hardwired in. How do you uh, get to the air filter safely? Well, you know, a service switch would be really nice. So that's what that means. That is for me, right, to remind myself that there's something wrong here. 
So again, I don't have time to draw little arrows and little circles and write text on my images. I just do that, right? And I point, use my finger. This is a more great moisture meter as well, your hand. So there's no service disconnect. There's a refrigerant line. We saw it on the outside. Um, there's a condensate line coming from the air conditioner trap drain into a condensate pump. Remember the tube on the outside was kind of nasty. The tube on the inside is kind of nasty. So I'm going to recommend that that be serviced and cleaned. And there's the um, the vent pipe connector, the connect, connecting uh, pipe of the gas fired furnace, the vent connector or the vent connector pipe, I like to say, the metal pipe that takes the exhaust gases from the furnace appliance into the chimney stack. And we saw the chimney stack on the roof, remember? And the collar was rusted. I don't like the clearance. There's no clearance here. I'm not a code inspector, but I'm gonna call this out because that thimble is like a double protection, right? But I'm not sure if that should be a half inch clearance or one inch clearance from the drywall or not. And it looks like the drywall was installed after that was installed. I don't know what's going on. I don't like combustible materials near a really hot furnace. And the exhaust pipe is, we're in hundreds of degrees, the exhaust gas is coming from a natural draft furnace heat exchanger. That's hot, man. So I'm gonna call this out. And if the HVAC guy comes and says, there's nothing wrong, great. Let that technician say, everything's fine. There, there is no fire hazard. That's fine, I can do that. And I'm kind of concerned about the slope too. Uh, you know, that's that furnace there and that flue of the hot water tank coming in at a weird angle because the pipes got in the way. It's kind of flat. So I've got two concerns now. I've got the rusted collar at the top, um, poor flashing at, around the chimney stack at the top, remember, in the, in the webinar. And then I've got this vent connector pipe that's almost level. And I have an inadequate clearance from combustible materials. I've got really great things for uh, reasons for recommending HVAC service and cleaning and further evaluation. Drain waste vent plumbing. I, I can't find any. Everything's finished and there's no basement. So I go down to the first floor and I'm looking for a basement. There's no basement, there's no crawl space. So the, those foundational cracks, they went down to a foundation that wasn't uh, a walk in basement or anything or a crawl space. And this is the only pipe I see. And it's not part of the plumbing pipe. It's a radon mitigation system pipe because there's a little sticker that says something about radon and there's no meter. There's no sensor like um, the manometer, you know, with the red or blue liquid in it to show that there's um, a, a radon fan sucking the air into the system. There isn't that. And it doesn't look like it's labeled well or properly, or I don't know where this point is. I'm going to, pull out my phone, right? I have a checklist on how to inspect all of the uh, features of a well-performing radon mitigation system. I bet this system was installed a long time ago. It doesn't have a couple of features that I'm looking for, like manometer and uh, a good sticker that's re uh, easily uh, readable. That's one of the things. It needs to be labeled. You got to tell people this isn't where the sewer is. This is a radon mitigation pipe. And uh, the type of pipe might be wrong. It's schedule 10 instead of 40. And I can get that from my checklist that I have. And so I'm going to turn to my client and say the magic words. While I'm here, those are the magic words. While I'm here performing a home inspection, home inspection only, would you like me to inspect this radon mitigation system? I have a checklist here, according to modern standards. And we'll, we can see if there's any problems with the installation of this radon mitigation system. There could be some things wrong. I already see three things that are wrong that make it a concern for me. We're not sure if this is performing well. And there's only one way to know if a radon mitigation system is performing as the way it should be, is to test it. So magic words, while I'm here, why don't you hire me to inspect this radon mitigation system itself, the pipes and electronics in the fan. And while I'm here, why don't I perform a radon test? 
pool. This is ancillary inspections, and this is where profit is. So I'm here performing a home inspection, and I come across something like a radon mitigation system, and I have an opportunity for my clients to get more information. And I can provide that information while I'm here at a low cost. Because while I'm here, my prices for while I'm here ancillary inspections are a little bit lower, right? Because while I'm here, I'm gonna, this is just basically profit for me. It's only going to, going to add a few more minutes of my time, right? But a lot of gross income. So in business, think of a fraction um, to make money. It's very, this is a very simple, uh, simplistic idea, but you may get the point. So uh, remember uh, in grade school math and you have a fraction, top is numerator divided by denominator. So at, at, on the fraction, the top is your gross revenue divided by what? Time. So what you wanna do is have a huge top, have a huge numerator, have a huge amount of gross, as much gross revenue as possible. So that's home inspection and you attach ancillary radon mitigation system service and ancillary radon gas test, right? So that's a couple hundred bucks more divided by your time. If you don't expand your time, that's good. You're making a lot of money in a little bit of time. What if it was flipped? What if you're making $200 home inspection and you need to take all day long? You take six hours to perform a home inspection. That's that's bottom heavy. You don't want to do that. To be profitable, you want your gross revenue really big divided by a little bit of time. And to be more efficient, you want to squeeze that denominator. You want to squeeze your time. You don't want to run through a house and screw all your clients because you're not inspecting everything like you should be. You want to be efficient with your time. And efficiency comes with one of these things, right? You want to be efficient with your time. And uh, a mobile device, mobile software helps you reduce your time. And adding ancillary services, ancillary inspections, adds your, to your gross revenue, hopefully without adding too much time. You're gonna add some time, but maybe not too much. If I can make another $300 in an extra 15 minutes, I like that rate. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna add those ancillary inspections. How do I do it? I'm gonna look for opportunities and say the magic words, while I'm here. While I'm here, while I, Yada yada. Okay, so ancillary inspections is where the profit is, and guess what Internachi does? Internachi has over forty-five additional different types of inspector certifications, and they're all free and online. So if you wanted to be a, um, a certified um, home energy inspector, we haven't even gotten to the energy features of the house yet you could turn to your client and say, you know, I'm a certified home energy inspector. Would you like me to add a home energy report to this home inspection? It'll give you a lot more information about energy efficiency issues that I see and how to correct them in order to save money. On average, my clients who order a home energy inspection and a report can save about $1,200 a year. That's a really nice weekend vacation for my family. Are you interested while I'm here, while I'm here, you know? So these are opportunities that you can do and you can become, you can offer various types of ancillary services and be trained and certified in each one of them through Internet School, free and online. Okay, so let's see. Just taking a look at the questions, Facebook, Go to webinar. Okay, so right there is a natchiorg slash home hyphen inspection hyphen checklist. I apologize for the long URL. It's like an SEO kind of thing. So natchiorg slash home hyphen inspection hyphen checklist is where you'll find the checklist to inspect a radon mitigation system. <laughs> Just download it. It's free and incorporate it into your software and get ready to say, while I'm here, why don't I inspect? this radon mitigation system to make sure it's actually working. Let's take a look at the water supply. It's very easy, 30, sec 30 seconds to inspect the water supply. There's a water supply coming in. Remember, there's no basement, so the water supply from the street is coming up through 
the slab on grade foundation. So this is the lowest livable section. It's all finished and covered with drywall, which that drywall was installed after this was, uh, they put a lot of drywall up, up. So I can't see a lot of things. So they put drywall up against a really hot vent connecting pipe from the furnace. Shut up valve, jumper cable, bonding, water meter, another shut up valve. I don't see a check valve or pressure regulator valve. That's in my report. It's not leaking. The best way to determine if something's leaking is you use your hand, best moisture meter ever invented, and you just wipe the bottom. And if there's water marks, that's a leak, right? Because it's like impossible to put your water meter underneath a, a bolt, you know? It's just, so use your hand. I do. I use my hand on, on every valve. So if I'm looking at a, a bathroom sink, right? Open up the cabinet, look at the bathroom sink, the trap, and I get my hand and I wipe the bottom of the valve and the bottom of the trap. And that's pretty good. That's a pretty good way to test. Let's see if there's a water leak. Water source, hot water tank, gas fired, shut up valve on the cold line coming in. There's the temperature gauge. Don't mess with it, but that's how you change the temperature. I document the temperature gauge. Someone accused me once of cranking it all the way hot, turned out to be the plumber, um, forgot. He was testing something and forgot to turn it back. So um, the plumber was there during, at the end of the inspection. I was wondering, hey, what are you gonna, we're fixing the plumber. Okay, so I'm putting in the report. So document things, prior and after. That's why I take a picture of the electrical panel before I touch it and then after I touch it. Manufacturing label, natural gas right here is an indication of a backdraft of the flu. I'm not too concerned, but I'll put it in the report. That's a plastic washer. It, it, it could be it could be removed, but it's there. It's not like a functional thing, but it's melted. So that means we did have a backdraft. It was probably once, probably will never happen again. I don't know. There could have been. It's a natural draft. So these things burp a little bit. If you can explain, but I'm going to put that in a report. There should be a carbon monoxide detector as well installed um, according to local code or national code or best practices. So whenever there's a natural vent, natural draft, that means air from the room is going up into this flue pipe. And that's, there's no fan. There's a possibility of it backdrafting and it's hot flue gases. And sometimes they, they'll, they'll scorch something or melt something or deteriorate something that's close by. And so this hood, um, is the natural draft vent hood, and it could be backdraft, and it could cause a problem like that, and that's an indication of a, a prior problem. So now I've got a plumber coming. TPR extension pipe. No leaks at the bottom. That's good. It should be extended to the floor. There's a couple things that you should probably pay attention to on every TPR relief valve, how it extends to the floor, through the pipe, and all that stuff, and how do you know what they are? There's actually 14 requirements of a properly installed TPR relief valve discharge pipe. Where is that? In the latest International Residential Code, section P208.04.6.1. I wouldn't refer to code, but I would use code. And just like you use InterNACHI's free online courses as a foundation upon which to build a really good inspection process. So use these two. All of InterNACHI's um, courses are based upon standards. So if you take the courses, that's fine. But if you want to look at the actual code, it's available to you. So there's 14 things that the TPR valve needs to comply with. There are 14 requirements. One of them is um, what? Um, if the TPR discharge pipe has to be um, going down slope. I found one TPR pipe, oh, many actually, in my experience in my many years of performing inspections, um, TPR, TPR uh, discharge pipes going vertical up, right? So that's no good, that's a defect. It has to discharge within the same room, within sight has to be conspicuous because if a, de uh, a pressure relief valve is discharging, it has to discharge where you're going to see it because that's an indication of a serious problem. So you can't be discharging it outside into the gutter or underground or somewhere no way you can see. It has to be in the same room as being conspicuous right there. So a couple things like that. 
structure. It's a slab on grade. So any picture that I take of the lowest livable finished floor, that's the structure. I really can't see anything other than those little hairline cracks in the foundation. Attic and insulation. Attic and, when I get to the attic and insulation, wow, I'm moving along. I'm, I'm doing really well, but I really can't enter this attic because it doesn't have a floor. So it's not safe. Fiberglass, loose fill insulation, looking kind of fluffy all over the place, a little disturbed here and there, probably because of the cable or phone technician. The structure looks good to me, trusses, if I see any modified cut damaged trusses, um, that's no good. You can't modify or cut or damage a truss after it's installed without a structural engineer taking a look at it. There's clips on the ply wall, uh, plywood on the particle board. Looks good. I see a vent. Remember that turtle vent or that hood, that square hood? That's one vent. I take a picture of a mouse trap if I see it, and I'll put it in the report that I observed the mouse trap. I also look for rat traps, um, nests from animals, um, pet doors, um, mouse droppings. I won't identify termites, but I'll, I'll look for damage that's caused by insects or organisms. Vents, vent pipe, looking for any kind of roof problem. I ventured out and took a look at this. So this is a um, this is my access to the attic space through the second floor bedroom ceiling in the closet. And that's my picnic blanket. So I put a picnic blanket on top of um, the clothing or personal items on the shelf that is below the access panel so that when I move the access panel, it doesn't get stuff on other people's things. So I use a picnic blanket because a picnic blanket, uh, you know, should be clean enough to eat off of. So that's why I use a picnic blanket to protect other people's stuff. Okay, interior rooms and bathrooms. It's very easy, maybe 15 minutes for all the interiors and all, 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 the, all interior rooms and bathrooms. Um, I think there's two and a half baths in this house and basically a bathroom is a couple minutes. Uh, you can flush the toilets, um, use the side, of the, the side of your leg to see if it wobbles on the floor, flush the toilet, turn on the water, hot and cold at the sink, shower, tub, look for water leaks, look for functional flow, test the GFCI, look for a window or a, a light or a vent or a bathroom or a vent or something like that. All bathroom vents exhaust outside and look at the services. Very easy, in and out. Toilet, sink, shower, tub, shower, shower floor, pipe, drain pipe, GFCI. There's a stain on the vinyl because of the carpeting. And so there's a discoloration. It's a minor cosmetic, it's a cosmetic defect. I'll put it in the report as um, courtesy. That's another cosmetic defect. That's an actual iron that has scorched the carpeting. I'll put that in the report as courtesy. Open and close, representative number of windows, representative number of doors, um, representative number of wall receptacles. So I'll take a picture of what I did, take pictures of every room. Um, any smoke detector without a battery backup is a defect. Any smoke detector that's yellow, that wasn't designed to be yellow, um, is a defect. It's an indication of age. And that one doesn't work. So I tested it, and it actually didn't work at all. So that's what that cross finger means. Next bathroom, same thing, toilet, shower, tub, GFCI. I'm not really concerned about the plumbing traps. I'm not supposed to have S traps, P traps or the standard. Um, there's the vent coming from the second floor bathroom. Um, where the vinyl meets the shower or tub wall, I kind of push on it and see if there's any water damage there underneath the vinyl. This floor has a cut in the vinyl. It's also this cut colored and stained, just like the other one. There is no plumbing access panel for the shower, no plumbing access panel there. I can't see the plumbing from the access panel. I like to have plumbing access panels. Another bathroom, there's the ash trap, so it's, the sink is probably going to gurgle. GFCI protection. The door doesn't really open and close very well. It's kind of sticky. Oh, this is the door 
Oh, this is the front door. Yeah. So this is the front door. That's the with the throw latch. Yeah. They don't really have a throw latch on a bathroom door. So that's the metal door and it, it sticks. So that's what I'm showing there in the picture. Windows, receptacles, I'm trying to wrap up. I know I have an attached garage. So I'm trying to get to the attached garage. There's a, a broken window feature, um, no big deal, minor. Looking at the corners of things, corners of things, the corners of rooms, corners of the laundry room. There's the ceiling. I like to take a look at the ceiling below the second floor bathrooms. And there is a watermark there. So I'll call that as an active leak. The moisture meter was dry. The infrared didn't show anything. That is a moisture meter. They still make them. They're hard to find. Inspectorcoach.com and Inspector Outlet um, have these, I believe. And it's a, um, it's like an extended um, pin moisture meter. And you now if it's wet, it gives you a light and an audible indicator. And that's all it does. I like it because I don't have to get up on a ladder. I can just reach the ceiling to see if it's wet or probe through the carpeting and padding to see if the floor is wet. So it's kind of a, a neat thing. That's Inspector Outlet and Inspector Coach. InspectorOutlet.com, InspectorCoach.com. Uh, wall receptacles, doors, take a look around. As you can see, I just take pictures of me looking for things so I can describe, you know, to a judge, you know, that I did a thorough inspection and I did not come across that defect and they, my client is complaining about. I've been taken to small claims court. No big deal. Just make sure you have all your documents in order, documentation. You should have a, a local business attorney helping you. So when you do get that call, they can step in <clears throat> with a letter and help resolve those things. And the internet she has that kind of service. When you buy insurance, ins home inspector insurance with Internachi, um, there's a, a claims person who can come in and just try to squelch, kill that complaint with a strong letter uh, supporting you. If that goes even further, oh, and you can find that insurance at natchiorg slash insurance. And um, you should have an agreement system in place. Internachi has an agreement system. It's like a legal Zoom for home inspectors. Um, it's within your um, online account. You can get to all the legal documentation that you need. Make sure you have pictures, video if you can have video, lots of uh, a really nice narrative report and um, pictures are worth a thousand words. So take pictures of everything and that'll help you. But, you know, I went to small claims a few times. Somebody sued me for cat urine in the carpet padding. And that's well beyond the scope of the home inspection. So I was in and out. We were in and out in like five minutes. Um, there's a vent pipe, uh, not a vent pipe. There's the duct work from a floor register. So sometimes I'll pull off a floor register, stick my hand in there, see if there's anything in it, or really a camera and take a shot. Sometimes there's a lot of debris from when the house was built. And you'll see nails and wood and sawdust and a lot of things like that that may um, affect people who are sensitive to those things. And maybe I would, if, if I saw a lot of construction and dust and hair and all that stuff in a ductwork in one of the bedrooms that I randomly selected, um, I'll recommend a, um, a duct cleaning. Fireplace, remember the fireplace? We had uh, the fireplace cap, the metal cap was rusted uh, at the beginning of this presentation, remember? That was a defect. Well, I'm looking on the inside of the fireplace, looking for defects. It's sooty, so I open up the damper door because you're required to open and close the damper door to make sure it works. And when I opened it, a lot of soot came out. And it's just filled with soot. There's so, there's an inch of layer of soot on the damper door itself, and it's just stuck there. So we need a chimney sweep. That's great. And I'm looking for any kind of indications of rollout of smoke. That's no good. Or damage to the firewall. And there is. So there's significant major damage to the um, walls of the factory built fireplace. This isn't a brick fireplace. It's a factory built fireplace and those panels can be replaced. 
and it, they really need to be replaced. You cannot have breaches in that firewall and have a fire. It will just catch the chimney on fire. So you're really saving somebody from a fire. So you can see there's a lot of damage there. I'm trying to take a, a close-up shot of it. And there's a really good close-up shot. You can even see the um, reinforcement metal wire mesh inside this one and a half inch thick uh, firewall in the factory built fireplace. So take a look in there. Remember, if you, as you can see from my pictures, I started off away, then I moved in a little bit closer, and then I got to touch it. And by the time you get all the way to touch it, you already can see that what you want to focus on is the the defects that are both observed and deemed to be material. Laundry. I hate untested, um, I love braided pressure tested hoses. And those are not. Those are the cheap rubber hoses that tend to burst open when you're on vacation. Um, the dryer outlet this is an older house, older inspection, so they, those have changed. Um, there's a water catch pan underneath the, underneath the clothes washer, which is great, but it's actually damaged. So the rim of the water leak catch pan won't catch any water leaks. The garage. Here's why there was displacement of the panels that we observed a long time ago in the inspection, almost two hours ago in the inspection, right? It's because we're missing actual nuts and fasteners on the hinges of the panels of the garage door. So that's kind of cool. There's a couple that are missing. That's why it's loose and it sounds nuts when you open it. It's like that. I mean, there's just loose, missing nuts and washers and components of the garage door. So that's a great catch. Careful opening and closing it. So I opened it and closed it. And there are 10 steps to inspecting a garage door opener that's attached to a garage door, a vehicle garage door um, overhead. And you can follow those 10 steps easily. You don't have to forget them on your mobile device, right? You have your checklist. Uh, so we have a couple courses on how to inspect a garage door opener um, and a couple of videos on how to um, inspect a garage door opener in those 10 steps. So I would take a look at Internet. She's free online courses and videos. Using normal operating controls, they open and close. There's the mechanics. That's the first step. You check for the red handle um, release. And, uh, and then for the rest of the garage, all receptacles in the garage, all of them have to be on a GSCI. And the panel, the main electrical panel is in the garage. I'm looking at all the corners, looking for damage water damage, insect damage. Remember we had a lot of siding above the bottom of the um, up siding that was buried by um, vegetation and or like mulch and ground. There wasn't any clearance, so I'm kind of concerned. This is my really, this is my opportunity to look at the structure of the home because the rest of it was just finished. There was no crawl space or basement. And then I want to demonstrate with this picture that I tried to see everything, but I really can't. There's so much stuff in my way. A visual inspection is really limited and restricted. And the picture's worth a thousand words. So if I got sued or brought into court or somewhere or had a complaint, I would um, show that this was um, what I was working with at the time of the inspection. It's very difficult to see everything. So I'll take a picture of my flashlight in my hand and a picture of that, just to demonstrate that I'm really trying to look and see everything about the structure, or maybe how the bottom plate is attached to the foundation. So I take pictures of a lot of things in the garage, all the surfaces. The floor has a hairline crack, no big deal. In this picture, there's a major defect. Can you see what it is? Mm, 
I'm just looking at the questions. Did I remember? Yeah. No, I testified our inspection. Okay. There's a firewall breach in the garage ceiling. You can't have exposed wood and an opening and a pull down stairs um, in a garage. So this was installed maybe by the homeowner, maybe by the builder, not sure, doesn't matter. You can't have it. You can't have this in the ceiling of a garage, residential garage. Fire starting in the garage um, will just blow right through this and then will spread throughout the whole house. And there's also damage to the drywall over here. So you can't have damaged drywall either because a fire will find that breach. So that's what it looks like. And here's the attic above the garage, wiring and all that stuff and up oh, the radon fan. There's the radon fan. So we can take a look at that and see if it's compliant with modern standards for a radon mitigation system. And that's why that one flashing, remember the flashing on the roof was so damaged because it was different from all the rest. It was rubber, a cheap rubber thing that the radon mitigation system folks installed. So I used to install radon mitigation systems. So I know a little bit about inspecting them. There's the flue pipe from the furnace, remember that? Looks good. I don't see any watermarks. Remember, I was concerned about the flashing and the fastening. Looks okay. I don't see any signs of prior or active leaks. And then there's the chase. Now this chase comes from that furnace room. And you can see that some of the walls are insulated and some are not. The walls that are not insulated are actually the walls in the garage. And the walls that are not uh, are insulated are the ones that um, on the other side are conditioned rooms. And what we don't want is conditioned air escaping the house and being um, chased up, essentially. So this is a stack and there's a, a natural physics uh, thing that goes on in buildings that air tends to have a stack effect. Every building has a stack effect where air tends to be sucked in from the lower areas and exhaust out uh, naturally, vented out, and sometimes by pressure, and sometimes usually um, unintentionally. And stacks like this should be sealed up to prevent any kind of escaped condition air from escaping into the outside. So that's a, a home energy efficiency opportunity. And if I was um, inspecting the home, and I was certified through Energy as a home energy inspector. I would turn to my client and say, while I'm here, would you like me to uh, report upon some energy deficiencies that I observe and some opportunities to save energy with insulation and air sealing? There's that damage drywall. Somebody stepped on it or stored something up there. So that needs to be fixed, and that's the surface. Okay, electrical panel. It's in the garage. You're not required to remove the dead front cover. Don't, it's hazardous, it could be fatal, so don't do it. But I opened up this one. You're not required to, uh, to do it by the standards of practice. And what I'm looking for are major problems, like the easy defects to find are the breakers that are really fat, big breakers, like a 20 or 30 gauge breaker and amp breaker and on a small gauge wire, big breaker on a small gauge wire. And got one. So here's a 20 amp breaker on a 14 gauge wire. That's an improper set. That's an impacity problem. That's over fusing. So in our electrical course or our standards course, 25 standards or electrical course, how to perform a residential electrical inspection, um, this has gone over a couple times. So you want to identify those defects. You don't want a big breaker connected to a small wire. Kitchen. I end my inspection in the kitchen because, well, that's where everybody likes to hang out and talk and have coffee and hopefully something to eat for that home inspector. Um, so I'll inspect the kitchen last and that's where I'll, I'll wind everything up, I'll summarize, I'll go over and I get paid and then we shake hands and move on. Kitchen sink, hot and cold water, take a look 
for leaks. There is a leak at that um, feature at the sink. There's a garbage disposal. So the, the filtering system looks kind of old. Uh, so, and it's leaking at the top, so that's no good. GFCI protection, GFCI protection, that's good. But that one doesn't work. So this count all count kitchen counter receptacles um, and more have to be protected by GFCI. And there's AFCIs as well. And this home was built in the past before AFCIs. So I will call that out as a defect at the electrical panel. I don't see any AFCIs and we have GFCI problems as well. So now we need an electrician. We have an overfusing inside the panel at a 20 amp breaker on a 14 gauge wire, lack of AFCIs and problems with GFCIs. I'll turn on the dishwasher. I'll run a short cycle while I'm there. If it leaks, great. That's absolutely fantastic. It has leaked in the past um, and I take a picture of it. It's probably a gasket problem, but who knows, it could be something else like a drainage problem. And I'll put it in the report. I'll wipe everything up. I'll try to drain it and put it back to where I, I found it. Stove top, oven. Um, ideally, it would be venting outside especially if it was gas, I would recommend a, a, a vent over the range that exhausts outside, but this one's okay. Recycling, electric stove. I do a summary, it's about 10, 15 minutes. I have a report summary in my inspection report software, and I can send the entire report to my client immediately after the inspection. And the report summary is very quick, just a few pages long. And then a report itself has a bunch of pictures in it. And there's the member of the leaning posts of the um, rear gazebo structure, wooden structure. Um, so what I do is uh, I write my reports in the same sequence as I inspected it, which is very similar to the standards of practice sequence. So the first section, the first chapter of my report is the roof, and that's the first section of the standards of practice, and that's the first section that I actually inspect. That's the first system I inspect. Second system I inspect is the exterior, and I believe that's the second system of the standards of practice, and that's the second chapter of my inspection report. And it's also similar to how um, uh, the home maintenance book, the NNG home maintenance book, now that you've had a home inspection, now that you've had a home inspection, house problems are yours. It's basically the, the gist of the, the home maintenance book. And inside, um, it's a really nice home maintenance book. It's only $2.70 $2 each. And it adds weight to your, to your electronic report. It also has um, about 10, 12 um, different reasons to hire you again, to come back again every year to inspect the house. And every chapter of this is kind of reflective of my inspection process as I move through the house. So that gives the client this um, consistency. Like, oh, I remember going through the house. This, and then we went down to the basement, and here's the report of the basement. And then we moved up into the attic, and here's the an inspection report of the attic comments. So there's a nice flow and consistency there. So there's the air conditioning. A lot of correction and further evaluations. So if there's um, any type of there's a, a wherever there's in the report uh, recommendation like a monitoring recommend recommendation. There's um, it's in red and all caps and italicized. I want to get and bolded. I want to get my attention. Uh, the one, I want to get my client's attention whenever I made a recommendation. Everything else is black, um, blue ink. Doesn't really you know it just describes like here's the electrical system some narrative disclaimers. Here's the meter. It's in good condition, grounding outside, main electrical line, location of the panel, and then the next page there, breaker, la breaker labeling. Most of the breakers are labeled, not all of them. They all should be more clearly marked. So that's a recommendation there. And it's in red, ink, bold, all caps, italicized. Just a recommendation. It's not a requirement. It's really up to you and how you report your defects. But I, um, any type of recommendation was all read. So here's a good, here's monitoring recommended, improvement recommended, improvement repair recommended, correction and further evaluation recommended. So 
and that was for the water leak catch fan that should be replaced and the rest of the report looks like that and there's the kitchen there's some illustrations and you can get those illustrations to spice up your inspection report from internachi they're free downloadable high res if you want and that's a that, that's at natchi.org slash gallery if you wanted to boost the look of your inspection report. There's a final report conclusion and walkthrough. And there's a letter from my company um, to the homeowner that we left. And you can also do creative things like this. This is from the Internet member marketing team. A little lunchbox that says, we really appreciate you as your business card. Thank you for allowing us to inspect your home. Look inside. And this is for the homeowner. When they come back, um, at, maybe after work, after the inspection is over and we're out of there, they open up the lunchbox and what's inside? Well, that's really up to you, right? There could be some marketing material about, hey, I just inspected your home. I took care of it. Um, maybe request a copy of the inspection report and you'll see that I'm the best inspector in the whole world, yada, yada. If you're moving in the neighborhood, I can be your home inspector, something like that. Because every seller is a potential client. Uh, at 11 one I swipe credit cards into my checking account. And if you don't know how to do that, go to natchi.org slash merchant, natchi.org slash merchant. And merchant means you're, you have a, um, an ability to accept credit card payments. And here's your homework. Look up the word commodity. And then we already talked about it earlier in the class. And then what you want to do is look up these following web pages, natchi.org slash everything. And that's a web page of 15 steps to be successful. And it doesn't matter if you're a beginner inspector or a veteran, you should go through those steps, make sure you have checked off everything that identifies uh, a successful home inspection business. Um, natchi.org slash mentoring, if you want some mentoring from um, experienced inspectors who have agreed to volunteer their time to help other inspectors. Natchi.org slash mentoring. Inspectorcoach.com is a coaching service. I know the coach, she's great. But I would first download the free stuff that she has available. So there's free, um, there's, a, there's a checklist for success in eight steps. So it's shorter. Uh, oh, here it is. You can download the free eight steps checklist. That's what I would do. Or you can, it looks like this, eight steps to building a successful home inspection business. Because sometimes you need a mentor, an experienced inspector, a coach to help you assess where you are, set goals, and then make a customized plan to reach those goals. And so a coach or a mentor should be customizing. There are systems out there that they try to apply to everybody in a blanket kind of way, and that doesn't work. So you want custom one-on-one -on -one coaching, but don't, don't hire anything. Uh, download. Download for free the materials first. Natchi.org slash contact is where you can find everybody. Two more things. Natchi TV. Some of you are already on Natchi TV right now. We do free live webinars for home inspectors. Um, I really love the business and marketing tips for home inspectors. Look for that guy on the couch. That is your competitor who is really into um, watching uh, football games all day or um, the TV shows, or maybe he's playing a game, a video game, and you're going to beat the heck out of your competitor who's doing that because that is not you, right? And you want to get smarter while you're driving from job to job. So go to our podcast natchi.org slash podcast and um, you'll hear me talking to you um some questions taking a look at facebook hi bradley on facebook thanks for showing up um angela says how long should we keep pictures for legal purposes you should probably consult your legal business attorney but um, it's very easy to keep pictures and reports forever. When testing automatic safety reverse, do you close the door on a two by four, paper towel, roll, or a different way? So that's the 10th step. That's the physical contact reversal test. And internet does not recommend that you do it because you're 
you're going beyond a visual only home inspection. There are 10 steps, nine of them are visual only, kind of. The 10th one is actual physical contact reverse. So be careful with that. Um, DOSMA, I forget what it stands for, but it's the manufacturers of garage door openers have um, recommended a two by four lying flat below uh, on the floor of the garage where the garage door comes down and it should automatically reverse. So if you want to do visual only kind of, it's not really, but you know, if you don't want to touch the door with your hands, you can do the flat two by four and you can carry a flat two by four in your toolbox, maybe six inches long. It's very lightweight, doesn't get in the way and just put it down, let it bounce back. It should bounce back. If it doesn't, that's a problem. I like the, uh, the paper towel rule, but um, eventually it's gonna have to stop before it hits the gr uh, garage floor. So, you know, it's squishy for a while, but eventually the, the idea is that it hits something solid uh, instead of the floor. Um, so if it's a detached garage, um, there's a less concern about a fire moving from a detached garage to a house, right? Because it's detached. Um, there's some clearances if it's within three feet. Um, there's a couple of things in, in the standards in the building codes um, where you want some drywall. Um, but you know the idea is that if it's an attached, attached garage, you don't want any. Like you want to look for ductwork, you want to look for openings, you want to look for breaches, you want to look for the seams, you want to look for everything that allows um, a fire to blow through that firewall into the house on an attached garage. Detached, it's less of a concern. You're right. Tamara, concerns about the electrical wires close to the flu stack? Yeah. Uh, like I said before, there are defects. Um, in my presentation, that I'm not going to identify them all, but I think we identified um, the um, the uh, in earlier in the presentation where there was a flue pipe, hot flue pipe that could be um, uh, too close to combustible materials like the the drywall. Yep, I I I hate seeing wires lying on hot <laughs> ducts. I mean, it's just insane. Keep especially chimneys. I mean, even though code, right, may say one inch clearance or something at minimum, that's just the minimum. So I want that away. And you're not a code inspector or the local township building inspector. So you could say whatever you feel. That's your opinion as a certified home inspector. You want that away? Do it. You know, if, if you are siding on your client's side, you know, then you, it's like, um, it's like stairs and handrails, that's my example. So in code, it says you're required to have a handrail for a stair, stairway with four or more risers. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm a home inspector, I'm not a code inspector. If I see one step, two steps, without a handrail, I'm calling it out as a defect because I, I have family members and I have friends and I know people who can't make one step without a handrail. Well, just can't. And they need a handrail. And if that's my client, I am not going to notice that and not say anything. I'm a home inspector. I'm going to be on the side of my client. So that's an example of what a home inspector does and what a code inspector does. Code inspectors are stuck in code. I don't have a code book. They're stuck in that thick code book. They can't go beyond it even though they know that an old person needs help going up a stairway, they can't make that recommendation. They're stuck. It must be really frustrating to know that code stinks in this particular situation. And they probably just wish they, they were a home inspector so that they can make recommendations that are applicable in the real world. So that's an example of what I do. I see one step handrail recommendation bam almost immediately yep uh let's see that's the beauty of being a home inspector right would you call retro two prong with no ground a defect yes <laughs> because uh modern day receptacles have a ground right so if you're expecting to buy a home that's 
built to a standard, right? I mean, you want AFCIs protecting everything, just like a modern home is. You don't want an agent to try to convince you that it was it was it's grandfathered. Well, it's grandfathered. Well, the another code thing is um, the space between the vertical spindles of a rail can't be more than four inches. Can't have a four inch sphere. You can buy this from Inspector Ella. Can't have a four inch sphere pass through the space between the spindles of a handrail. That's the modern code. Now, if a house is built in 1975, that's six inches, I believe, if I remember right. But it's it's unsafe. All most of the homes that home inspectors inspect were built to code 30 years ago, which means that they have inherent defects in them simply because they were built to code back then. And people have gotten hurt since then. So they've revised the code so that people don't get hurt. Children don't fall through railings anymore because code changed. So if you ever see a space between spindles that's large enough for a foreign sphere to pass through, that's a defect. And you're helping children not get hurt. Unfortunately, code changes when someone gets hurt, like the fire code, unfortunately, you know? Fire code changes because of things that happened in the past. So you can feel that connection with helping people that you just met by um, knowing what the standards are and being able to make recommendations beyond those standards, right? So the sphere with the railing, the AFCIs, the recommendation, the two prong things, these are all good recommendations reasonable recommendations for home inspectors, right? They are unreasonable recommendations for code inspectors. You can't just say it's crazy stuff like, well, you gotta install AFCIs or something, right? That's what building inspectors don't do that. Building inspectors inspect homes according to the, the local code, which is probably 10 years past. They're always way behind. The township is way behind the code, unless they adopt them immediately. And then for existing homes, they just let them be grandfathered in. That's why real estate agents have problems with the word grandfather. We're not code inspectors, we're home inspectors. And I personally inspected homes without any regard to the age. I could care less when the house was built. So if it was built 100 years ago, I'm still going to recommend AFCIs and GFCIs and smoke detectors. Okay. Uh, let's see, where can I find examples of written reports? Excellent question. Um, it's on that natchi.org slash everything. So go to this URL, natchi.org slash everything, and scroll down to this section about um, inspection reports. Why don't we just do it? Okay, so Here's Natchador slash everything, 15 step checklist for home inspector success. You scroll down and there's uh, resources for your website. It's really good. You gotta have a website. And then um, reporting software. So here's some, here's a link to discounted report software through Inspector Outlet. Here's how to write home inspection reports. Here's home inspection report checklists. And here's home inspection sample reports. So you click that. Good question, Charles. Charlie. Uh, thanks, John. Said very interesting. Uh, is there any kind of software that you recommend that chain charges a one-time fee that does not charge per? Uh, I don't know. I, I kind of like the per report, uh, per month. Charge per month, like seventy seventy-nine dollars. I think is. I don't know what it is for Spectre. Let's say it's a hundred dollars for Big Ben inspection report software. Right. I can make a hundred bucks. In a month. If you can't make 100 bucks in a month, you got a problem, right? I may not have $1,200 to buy an entire year's worth of software, but I can certainly go month to month. So that's my right, and that's how I think. That's my business strategy, but it could be different for you. So I don't know if there's a software with a one time fee. Um, I don't know. Um, that's part of the calculation when you're making a business decision. Obviously, how much does it cost? But you also have to figure out like, what do you want? 
you want to write while you inspect and you want the end report to be better than your competitors. So you want the best software at the best price that's easily accessible for you. So yeah, you have to figure that out. If, if, and I've been through a lot of software and it's turning out to be like, there's software that produces PDFs, there's software that's, that produces reports in the cloud. I kind of like the cloud stuff because you can't put a video in PDF. You can put a video up in the cloud. So you may want to think about that as well. And if there's one thing that people are going to judge you on, it's your inspection report. It's the one marketing piece. It's a, it's a, your inspection report is actually a marketing piece and it's gotta be really good. That's why you want the best software and for the best price. And you wanna work on your narratives or your sentences almost every day. You wanna keep making small improvements to the way you communicate every day. You don't have to take a big leap in anything in business. It's usually really risky. What you want to do in business is like you have, let's say a dozen things to do. Probably have a lot more than that. But let's say you have a dozen, dozen things to do. You want to do a little bit of work every day. You want to move forward, you know, you want to move like a, a lever, you know, like a soundboard where you turn off the sound. You want to move forward, you know, a little bit of marketing, a little bit of report. Okay, let's, let's uh, deliver some peaches to real estate agents and talk to them. Let's uh, work on the website. Let's upload to the social media. Okay, and now I'm gonna work on my scheduling uh, script. Uh, I'm working on my website again. Uh, you know, you don't want to go on one thing and concentrate. I'm gonna I'm gonna learn how to inspect EAPs for the next month and only do that one thing. The rest of your business it's crapping, right? So you have to. The success is um, small steps on a wide range. And it's manageable that way too. Uh, okay. Any questions on Facebook? Nope. Okay. Any questions through the webinar system? No. Woo. I want to show you this. This is one of the best things you can do for your business. I know. It's a newsletter. Uh, you've got more things to read? Yeah. Because I keep bumping into home inspectors that have no clue what is going on. And they're, they're asking questions about their business and how do, I, how do I boost my business? How do I be more successful? How do I grow it? How do I hire more people? How do I find about drones? That's all in the newsletter. Every month we put the best of the last two weeks. We, get, we have two newsletters every two weeks. We put the best stuff in the past two weeks in the newsletter. I'm not saying spend four hours reading the newsletter. I'm saying open up a newsletter, subscribe to it, so it pops in your inbox. You gotta subscribe, open it up, and scan real fast. You can read the newsletter on your mobile device, right? While you're eating french fries, before your second inspection, right? <laughs> scan through it and find that one thing that you need to read or watch or download that will help your business. That's all I'm asking. Subscribe to the newsletter. We have two every month. Every two weeks it comes out. And it, we give you the latest, best thing that you ought to know about. Scan it. Don't read the whole thing. Scan it and find that one thing that you need. That's all I'm asking. It's a really great idea. So you don't miss out. Okay? Um, and that's at nachi.org, N-A-C-H-I dot org slash monthly newsletter, one word natcha.org slash monthly newsletter. And I think I'm gonna leave you on that. What do you think? Did you have a good time? Hope you did. You probably registered through Natchi TV, and there it is, that's a little blue TV, N-A-C-H-I dot TV. That's where we have free webinars and we talk to each other and have a lot of fun every month or so. Um, so I'm Ben. Kramiko from InterNACHI. If you have any questions, we're on the contact page. And remember your homework, look up commodity, go through these URLs, slash everything, slash mentoring, inspectorcoach.com, and slash contact. And we're always available to you. 
and we think we have everything you need all in one place. If we don't, if you need something that you don't know how to find it, email us and we'll find it for you so you can be successful at being an international member and a certified home inspector. All right, everybody, see ya. Stay safe out there. Bye.